Our reading for today continues in the Gospel of John. We're still in chapter 1, today reading verses 29 through 34, where it says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came to baptize with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. That's so, this is the word of the Lord. And let us pray. Lord, what is offered here today in your word is such a rich announcement, such a rich proclamation. Open our eyes and ears and hearts to hear and see and believe all that John the Baptist and John the Gospel writer is sharing with us in these verses. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start with, uh, I heard a great, great quote from Andy Stanley. He's a popular preacher. He said this really wonderful thing. Jesus is not just a story in the Bible. Jesus is the reason that there is a Bible. Think about that. I'm sure I'll never forget it and will probably repeat it often from here on out. John's gospel is all about letting us know who Jesus really is and why he should be more than famous. In today's passage, John the Gospel writer adds more of John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus. This time he calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's pointing right at Jesus. Just the day before, John had said, Among you stands one you do not know. So when he pointed out Jesus, he was saying, Now you know, it's him. John the Baptist let everybody know that Jesus is exactly who he was talking about when he said the day before, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And he also let everybody know that Jesus is called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John also told everybody how he knew this. God revealed it to John supernaturally. John saw the Spirit come down upon Jesus. Verse 34 lets us know that God had told John the Baptist earlier that he was to look for that particular sign so that he would know for sure how special Jesus really is. We already dealt with the fact that John testified that Jesus existed even before he was born of the Virgin Mary. That is testimony that Jesus is more than a man and in fact must be God in the flesh because he already existed even before he took on flesh hiding in Mary's womb. And no mere human being could ever do that. So today I want to further unpack these three further important truths about Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. He is Holy Spirit anointed, and he is God's chosen one. But to get there, I first want to fill in more details about Jesus being baptized by John. It is interesting that John the Gospel writer didn't bother to include the fact that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. The Gospel writer was very focused on Jesus' true identity and John the Baptist's testimony about him. But from the other Gospels, we know that the Holy Spirit led, let John the Baptist know for sure about Jesus in the moment when John baptized him. That's when he saw the heaven-descended dove. It's also in those accounts that we read that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. 
So I want to go back over it a little bit. In Matthew 3, 13 to 17, we read, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This confirmation from God is what clinched it for John the Baptist so that he can say for sure what he always thought about Jesus might be true. Look at him and go, it is you. Notice that John already knew that Jesus was special when he said that he didn't want to baptize Jesus, but to be baptized by Jesus. The reason for that is that John knew that Jesus was born of a virgin and destined for greatness. He might have also known Jesus personally well enough to believe that Jesus was already fully living by the law, at least well enough that he, Jesus, did not need cleansing from sin, which is what baptism was about. We know for sure that Jesus was sinless and did not need baptism for the same reason everybody else did or does. But Jesus submitted to baptism as part of his humility to fully identify with sinful humanity and to set up the sacrament as our way to fully identify with Jesus when we confess our faith in him. For John the Baptist, the Spirit of God descended from heaven as confirmation from God. Matthew's account does read like God was talking to John as he announced, this is my son, as if he were pointing at Jesus rather than talking to Jesus like you are my son, as it says in Mark's gospel. Mark wrote a very simple and matter-of-fact gospel. In Mark 1, 9 through 11, it says, At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Similarly, when Luke mentions the baptism, it's also very brief, but notes in chapter 3 at verses 21 and 22, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Mark and Luke read as if God was speaking to Jesus. So some suppose that maybe only Jesus saw the dove and heard the voice. But John must have seen it and heard it too. Because Matthew reads that way. And John himself says so in the gospel that we're working through. Written by the other John. John the gospel writer. Does it bother you that the gospels don't agree exactly? Why are there four gospels anyway? Two points on that. First, if all four Gospels were exactly the same, we would only need one. And second, variations are not the same as contradictions. These accounts are not saying opposite things about the same events, just different points of view. That's why we have four different Gospels. God did not require or inspire one writer to say everything that could be said. He allowed each person to write his account for each one's specific purpose and audience. And then he inspired the church to keep and preserve the four best accounts for our benefit. God is a genius. If you put this in terms of Jesus being on trial in the world's court of law to establish Jesus' identity and innocence of any crime, God provided four witnesses, double the usual two required in Jewish law. 
That has much more credibility than one witness, which is what we would have if there were only one gospel for us to work with to learn about Jesus. Four witnesses increases credibility. Most importantly, we do see that all four gospel writers agree in including the most important point about the baptism. It functioned as a public confirmation of Jesus' identity as the Son of God. In the Gospel of John that we receive three additional points concerning the fullness of Jesus' identity. He's the Lamb of God, He's the Holy Spirit anointed, and He is the Chosen One. What does it mean that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? In order to understand who Christ was and what He did, we have to begin with the Old Testament, which contains prophecies concerning the coming of Christ as a guilt offering that's in Isaiah 53. In fact, the whole sacrificial system established by God in the Old Testament set the stage for the coming of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect sacrifice God would provide as atonement for the sins of his people. That's mentioned in Romans 8 and talked about extensively in Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 10 is where we learn that all that past sacrificial system was just a foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifice of lambs played a very important role in Jewish religious life. When John the Baptist referred to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Jews who heard him might have immediately thought of Genesis 22 verse 8. That's in the story in which Abraham almost sacrificed his own son Isaac in obedience to the Lord's command. He acted in faith. When his son Isaac noticed that they had everything for the offering except the sacrificial lamb, he asked his dad about that. Abraham answered him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And that's what we have in Christ. God himself provided the lamb. You can read that as Abraham's way of carefully avoiding the painful truth that Isaac was about to be sacrificed. Or you can read it as Abraham's faith in God to do something about this terrible situation by providing a substitute so that Isaac could be spared, which did ultimately happen. Even though the substitute that God provided for Abraham at that time was a full-grown ram and not a lamb, it could have been called the Ram of God the one chosen by God to die in the place of Isaac, who represented all of humanity by being the one through whom all of God's covenant promises would be realized and by whom all the nations would be blessed. And later on in their history, the Passover event required the blood of a lamb. The slaying of the Passover lamb and the applying of the blood to doorposts of the houses is a beautiful picture of Christ's atoning work on the cross. Those for whom he died are covered by his blood, protecting us from the angel of spiritual death. Jesus paid the price of sin with his blood. Another important sacrifice involving lambs was the daily sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. Every morning and evening, a lamb was sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people. These daily sacrifices, like all others, were simply to point people towards the perfect sacrifice of Christ on the cross. In fact, the time of Jesus' death on the cross corresponds not only to the fact that it was Passover, but also corresponds to the time of the evening sacrifice being made in the temple. The Jews at that time would have also been familiar with the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah, who foretold the coming of one who would be brought like a lamb led to the slaughter, Jeremiah 11, 19. And those sufferings, and whose sufferings and sacrifice would provide redemption for Israel. Of course, that person was none other than Jesus Christ, absolutely perfect, the Lamb of God. For Jesus to be called the Lamb of God would indicate that Jesus was God's choice of who should be sacrificed to take away the sins of the world to take away the sins of the world once and for all so that no more animal sacrifices would ever be needed would require an absolutely perfect representative, a sinless human being. 
All four Gospels note that Jesus is anointed by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, or full of the Holy Spirit. In actual fact, this goes without saying because Jesus is God and so is the Holy Spirit. But here it's being proclaimed publicly for the benefit of those waiting for Messiah and for our benefit as well. Here we see all the persons of the triune Godhead manifested simultaneously. God the Father speaks. God the incarnate Son exists. And God the Spirit descends like a dove to agree with and confirm the commendation of the Father. This multifaceted presence of God in one moment is really what made me think up my fish tank analogy, where the fish sees two hands of one person as two separate things that are really still just one person. It is important for all of Jesus' witnesses to know that the Holy Spirit came upon him because all of God's heroes in the Old Testament acted for God by God's authority and in God's mighty power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Even more importantly, all the Jewish kings of the Old Testament were anointed with oil to indicate the additional anointing of the Holy Spirit that they were supposed to rely on and be led by. So this anointing of the Holy Spirit is the first indication that Jesus is also to be their king and ours. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is indicated to be God's choice by the heaven descended dove lighting upon Jesus to single him out. The chosen one of God identified to John by God through the supernatural appearance of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 42 verse 1 uses this term in the next three verses to explain further. So listen to Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Thus, Jesus' experience at his baptism fulfills the prophecy to indicate that Jesus is the servant that Isaiah talked about, filled with the Holy Spirit, chosen of God, beloved Son, with whom God the Father is well pleased. So, early in the Gospel, John the Gospel writer is already setting us up to see Jesus as someone unique in all of human history. John did not use his material to slowly unveil the true nature and character of Jesus the way other Gospel writers like Matthew did, which starts with the birth story and just tells little stories until it leads up to the Passion and the Crucifixion. Then you realize who Jesus really is. John did it the other way around. John wanted us to know up front what he was going to prove about the identity of Jesus. And then he uses the rest of the material of Jesus' life as signs to prove his point, all so that we might believe in Jesus for salvation. So I want to end with this gospel announcement. Jesus, our King, is the King of the universe, King over all, King of our hearts. He will rule forever with power and might. His scepter is in his hand, and mighty is his wrath to judge the evildoers and establish peace in his kingdom. The good news is, this mighty king is known to us as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <clears throat> not the sins of the Jews or the children of Abraham, and not just the sins of the believers. The power to take away sin is not limited by anything deficient in him. His blood is more than enough to take away all the sins of everybody who ever lived. Nobody needs to be left out. No one has sinned beyond the point of forgiveness. No one ever has. No one 
ever will. But there is a limit. Imposed not by God, but by the people he created. Those who do not believe this gospel will not have their sins taken away. Not because they cannot be, but because they will not be. Unbelievers who have heard this gospel are refusing the grace offered to them so freely by the king of the universe who wants to make peace and not punish. God prefers to eliminate his enemies by making friends with them. But if they will not, then he cannot. He gives all people what they truly want. If they don't want peace with God, then his program of eliminating evil will wipe them out because they cannot stand against him and win. And if they want peace with God, it is freely granted by the blood of the Lamb of God. So make peace with God while you still have time. Let's pray. Lord, your offer of amnesty is so amazing and so far beyond anything we deserve. Your offer of peace, your terms of peace are simply that we would agree with you that you are right and that we have been wrong all along about wanting to live our lives apart from your sovereign will and apart from your common sense good laws and commandments too. Forgive us, Lord, for being so selfish. But thank you, Lord, for being our Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's wonderful and merciful, Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.